Hello and welcome to Unit 5. Lecture 5, we're going to talk about the immunological disorders. So first a term, a gamma globulinemia. That's a tough one to say. This is a general condition where an individual has periods of time where they are unable to produce antibodies. A specific type of A gamma globulinemia is called Burton's X linked A gamma globulinemia. And this is a disorder that's usually apparent by about um, six months of age. It's a congenital disorder that usually goes from mother to male children, although it's not um, it's not unheard of for it to go from male to female children. These kids have multiple bacterial infections such as Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Pseudomonads, and occasionally they can have pneumocystis. This is generally a respiratory type of disease. The, they're not overly susceptible to viral diseases. Um, also, their immunoglobulins are very, very low. So the treatment for this disease is to get IgG injections um, every three to four weeks for life. Their T cells seem to be okay, but mature B cell populations are absent in the bone marrow and lymphoid tissues. Their B cells never grow to maturity. Common variable immunodeficiency is also known as CVID, and this is usually seen in 20 to 30 year olds, but it can't be seen in children as young as 24 months of age. Usually this appears to, it, this appears to be a late onset disorder. One or many of their immunoglobulins is absent or very severely decreased. Usually IgM is severely decreased and IgG is severely decreased. Patients have sinus and pulmonary infections. Their normal B cell counts, are, um, they're normal, but they fail to become plasma cells. And this is related to an excessive number of T regulator cells. The treatment is immunoglobulin replacement therapy. Secretory component deficiency, it's the most common B-cell disorder. It affects one in every four to 800 people. This condition may actually evolve into CVID. It is associated with allergies and pulmonary infections and also autoimmune diseases. The clinical picture of this disorder is that they're generally ill. They may also have autoimmune disorders like lupus or thyroid issues, but they're no more susceptible to viral disorders or viral diseases. Their B cells are unable to mature to plasma cells. Hyper IgM immunodeficiency kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but it is an X -chromo chromosome mutation disease that occurs in the first and second year of life. Their IgM is increased. Their B cells produce almost only exclusively IgM. Their IgG and IgA immunoglobulins are actually low. They have an extremely low amount to absent IgG and IgA levels. They have recurrent pyogenic infections such as ear infections, sinusitis, and pneumonia. And they have recurrent neutropenia, hemolytic anemias, and aplastic anemia, which is a bone marrow disorder caused by low RBC production. One method to determine a person's serum levels of an antibody class is to do radial immunodiffusion, or RID. This is a quantitative precipitation method. We can use RID to quantitate a number of different proteins like immunoglobulins, CRP, alpha-1 antitrypsin, transferrin, and complement, as well as the antibody classes. It's a simple and specific test for the identification and quanti quantitation of a number of proteins found in human serum and other body fluids. So if you look at the image up there on the right, what happens is that there is an antigen in an agarose gel, and we take five microliters of patient serum and place it into the circle, and we watch for precipitation to diffuse around that circle. And then we measure that zone of precipitation, and we can actually take that zone size and compare it to a chart that tells us the amount of protein that they have in their serum, whether that be an immunoglobulin or CRP or what have you. Let's talk about the plasma cell dyscrasias, and that's just basically a fancy word for disease. So when plasma cells are greatly increased and completely infiltrate the bone marrow, this is called a plasma cell dyscrasia. Some examples of that would be multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. A monoclonal gammopathy is one characterized by severe increase in only one immunoglobulin type. It's an uncontrolled proliferation of a single clone of plasma cells. This leads to the synthesis of elevated quantities of only one immunoglobulin. All other immunoglobulins will be decreased. Some examples would be multiple myeloma, 
Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and cold agglutinin disease. Multiple myeloma, also known as plasma cell myeloma, is when you have plasma cell tumors that form in the bone marrow. The bone marrow cells are replaced with plasma cells. Normal bone marrow has less than 1% of plasma cells, but in multiple myeloma, patients can have up to 90% of plasma cells in the bone marrow. Their tumors start to erode the surrounding tissue. Fatalities usually occur as a result of renal failure or sepsis, one to three years after diagnosis. There is an unknown cause for multiple myeloma. It could be viral or radiation exposure. You will see RULO on the RBC with differential. Bence jones proteins are light chain proteins seen in the urine of people with multiple myeloma. To screen for Ben Jones protein, heat the urine. This protein will precipitate at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius and dissolve at 100 degrees Celsius, but then will reappear when the sample is cooled. This is seen in the patients with monoclonal gammopathies. These proteins are kappa or lambda light chains not attached to the heavy chain portion of an immunoglobulin. Other monoclonal gammopathies would include Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and cold agglutinin disease. Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is a malignant B-cell disorder where increased plasma cells are seen in the bone marrow. Many plasma cells make up a very increased amount of IgM. These large complexes make the blood viscous and they die of liver and spleen hemorrhage. There is possible genetic, this is possibly a genetic mutation disorder. Now, cold agglutinin disease is the other monoclonal gammopathy I wanted to talk about, and this essentially is a microobstruction of the circulatory system, sometimes considered a hemolytic anemia reactive with cold autoantibodies. Other monoclonal disorders would be light chain disease and heavy chain disease. Some signs and symptoms of these two types of monoclonal disorders would be weak, feverish, anemic, and patients may have enlarged spleen and an enlarged liver and an increased number of bacterial infections. Light chain diseases represent about 10 to 15 percent of all monoclonal gammopathies. Monoclonal proteins are composed of the light chain portion of the immunoglobulin class. Many light chain fragments are produced. In heavy chain disease, many heavy chain fragments are produced. Monoclonal proteins are composed of the heavy chain portion of the immunoglobulin. Monoclonal gammopathies are treated with steroids and chemotherapy. The polyclonal gammopathies involve several clones of plasma cells. There is an increase of more than one immunoglobulin, and this results from a secondary manifestation of the below conditions. A secondary manifestation of chronic liver disease like hepatitis B virus, chronic infections, or autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. The polyclonal gammopathies are not as common as the monoclonal gammopathies. Labs can detect monoclonal and polyclonal gammopathies with serum protein electrophoresis. Using different charges, serum proteins are separated into bands via electrophoresis. It's the, most commonly, it's the most commonly used test to diagnose the monoclonal gammopathies. Here you can see an example of an electrophoretic pattern. In the first band, we have albumin. In the alpha-1 region, we have alpha-1 antitrypsin. In the alpha-2 region, we could have things like C4 component of complement. In the beta region, we could have the C3 component of complement. And in the gamma region, we have all of our immunoglobulins and CRP. Immunoglobulins are found in the gamma band. So if we have a monoclonal gammopathy or a polyclonal gammopathy, you're going to be able to see that in the gamma portion of the electrophoretic pattern. One primary disorder of T-cells is Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. 36 million people are living with HIV, and 1.6 million people die every year from AIDS-related diseases. It is a, the clinical picture for AIDS is that there is extensive destruction of the T-cells, leading to a gradual depletion of the CD4 type of lymphocytes. Gradually, most of your T-helper cells are destroyed. The, AIDS is the leading cause of death in Africa and the fourth leading cause of death in the world. There's 1.2 million people in the U.S. that have HIV. Patients do succumb to opportunistic infections. HIV can be transmitted by blood, blood products, dirty needles, semen and vaginal secretions, 
It can be acquired from mother to child or through tissue transplants. It is not transmitted by casual contact. There is no evidence of mosquito transmission or by any human serum made vaccine. The virus can be isolated in blood and breast milk, but the highest concentration is in semen. It has been isolated in saliva and tears, but there's no evidence that it has ever been transmitted by saliva or tears. Populations that are at risk for infection with HIV are people with multiple sexual partners, people that are intravenous drug users or those who share needles, patients receiving multiple blood transfusions, both blood and blood products are screened for HIV, hemophiliacs being treated with factor VIII, infants born to mothers to the above groups, and healthcare workers. Let's take a look at the clinical manifestations of having HIV and AIDS. These patients um, will develop bacterial infections. Some examples would be Mycobacterium avium intracellulare. These patients will develop fungal infections such as Candida, Cryptococcus, and Histoplasmosis. These patients can develop protozoal infections such as Cryptosporidium, Pneumocystis, and Toxoplasmosis. They can actually develop viral infections such as CMV and herpes, and neoplasms such as Kaposi's sarcoma. And that image on the right there is, is an example of Kaposi's sarcoma. The immunolo immunological features of AIDS would be that there is a dysfunction of the host cellular immune response. The T helper cells are infected. A lymphopenia is pronounced. The T4 and T8 ratio are inverted. So normally we have 65% T4 cells and about 35% T8 cells, and that is actually completely the opposite in a person that has AIDS. And also they will experience a hypergammaglobulinemia. So how does the cell get infected with HIV? A virus particle binds to the outside of the susceptible cell and fuses to it. The viral particle is a viral protein designated as glycoprotein 120. It's an envelope antigen. And the receptor of the cell surface on the T helper cell is the CD4 receptor. This receptor is present on all T4 cells, macrophages, and B cells. The viral membrane fuses with the cell membrane, injecting the core material into the cell. The core material includes RNA and reverse transcriptase enzyme. This also includes P24, P17, P9, and P7. The viral RNA is converted into DNA, and this DNA is integrated into the DNA of the target cell. This migrates to the cell's nucleus. Viral DNA transcribes into viral messenger RNA. The new virus particles are created which go on to infect other T helper cells. Eventually the T4 cells are completely destroyed. The virus devastates the number of T cells because the CD4 cells are those destroyed by the HIV virus. The HIV virus is a retrovirus. A retrovirus does not convert DNA to RNA like other viruses do. It contains a single-stranded RNA and contains an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. The enzyme reverse transcriptase enables the virus to convert viral RNA into DNA. This reverses the normal process of transcription where DNA is converted to RNA. There are three important structural components of the HIV viral molecule. We've got the GAG proteins, the group specific matrix proteins, those are in the core of the virus. Some examples of that would be P24 and P7 and P25. We've got the pole proteins, the polymerase proteins, those are also in the core of the virus. And then we have the envelope proteins, the env EMV proteins, the envelope proteins that are outside and outer membrane of the HIV molecule. And I'll show you examples of these proteins on the next image. So although not the best drawn image, you kind of get the idea. You can kind of see the glycoprotein 120. That's the one that links up to the CD4 receptor on the T helper cell. We've got our GP41 protein. These are both envelope proteins or glycoproteins. Then we've got GP24, which is a GAG protein in the core of the virus. And we've got GP17, which is also a GAG protein. And GP134 and 68, which are pole proteins. There are a number of emerging therapies for AIDS, including blocking the binding of the viral envelope, 
keeping the viral RNA and reverse transcriptase from escaping their protein coat, inhibiting transcription of RNA into DNA, blocking translation of RNA into viral proteins, preventing modification of viral proteins, and preventing the virus particle from assembling itself and budding out of the cell. There's a few standard ways to test for HIV. Screening tests would include ELISA tests or PCR. And the confirmatory test for HIV is Western blot. When proteins are electrophoretically separated into bands, each band is tested with an individual serum. Antibodies will bind with the protein band. Black bands that appear with certain antigens and antibody combinations equal a positive test for HIV. Let's take a look at some of the T-cell disorders. One of the primary T-cell disorders is called Dejour syndrome, also known as congenital thymic hypoplasia. It is, it is a de developmental defect in the embryo, causing the absence of the mature thymus and parathyroid glands. It causes a malformation of the heart and blood vessels and neuromuscular issues. The T-cells are low, the B-cells are present, but antibody production is limited. Patients are more prone to infections. There is a cure, and that's a fetal thymus transplant. This can restore T-cell activity, but other deformities are an independent problem. Another primary disorder of T-cells is called chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. The T-cells respond inadequately to antigens of candida albicans. IgA levels are abnormal, and there's no known cause or cure. The T-cells respond normally to other antigens, but abnormally to the antigens of candida albicans. B-cell function is unaffected. The patient is prone to skin and mucosal surface infections. Severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome is a term for congenital disorders where part or all of the immune system fails to work properly. Some examples of severe combined immunodeficiency syndromes would be deficiencies of the T and B cells like Swiss type A gamma globulinemia, Wiscock Aldrich syndrome, and ataxia telangiectasia. Swiss type A gamma globulinemia is a very serious congenital disorder that affects 1 in 100,000 people. Most affected will die by the age of 2. It's an autosomal recessive disorder, and these people have persistent candidal infections. An early sign of this disorder is that candida infections. It is often associated with CMV and pneumocystis. The thymus is underdeveloped, and there's relatively no lymphocytes or plasma cells in the bone marrow no lymphocytes or plasma cells at all. Cell mediated immunity is absent. A bone marrow transplant for HLA identical sibling may correct this disorder. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome affects male infants and is usually fatal by the age of 10. It's an X-linked associated disease with thrombocytopenia, low platelets and eczema. Usually, this is associated with increased bleeding due to low platelets, the inability to respond to polysaccharide antigens, the antigens or proteins on bacterial cell walls, increased infections, IgM levels are low, there's no ABO blood group antibodies, the T cells are decreased, IgA and IgE are increased. IgM is very decreased, IgG is generally normal. Most people with this disorder develop autoimmune diseases and malignancies. Ataxia telangiectasia is a neurodegenerative inherited disease. It is essentially a disturbance of gait and posture, where superficial abnormalities of the blood vessels occur. IgA and secretory component is abnormal, and so it leaves our patients at risk for respiratory diseases. Their IgM is increased, their IgE is decreased, lymphocytes are decreased. Chronic respiratory infections are associated with this condition. Ataxia means lack of muscle coordination, and telangiectasia means dilation of the small blood vessels. Injections of gamma globulin may help treat this disorder. Now, how can we go about evaluating a person's immune competence? We can do that by using a number of screening tests. For example, Patient history, that is considered a screening test. Do they get frequent or unusual infections? We'd like to know that if they have an immunodeficiency. We can do a complete blood count and differential. We can do an HIV-1 antibody test or perform skin tests to common antigens. We can measure immunoglobulin levels and serum. 
test neutrophil function, and determine complement levels. We can do flow cytometry for T and B cell subset information. We can do lymph node biopsies or bone marrow evaluations. These are all different ways that we can determine somebody's immune competence. So that's it for Unit 5. Um, I'll see you soon for Unit 6.